ADHD has been described in medical literature for over 100 years. We began to treat the symptoms with medication at the end of the 30s. We don't know for sure what causes ADHD. Science indicates that it's a neurological problem, often genetic. Though over 75% of the cases can be explained by genetics, the other 10 to 20% are often related to neurological brain injury associated with prematurity or a lack of oxygen at birth, for example. It's been two years since I consulted about attention deficit disorder. Only because we had a child who had attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity and oppositional defiant disorder. While they were telling us about it, I began to realize that I had some symptoms. I began to read a lot on the subject, on the internet, and at libraries. I would read all of the information I could find. We devoured all the information we could get, and finally realized that among the list of symptoms, I don't remember how many there were. Let's say there were 15. I had like 13. So I began to think I had something too. But I'm the most ADHD of the family. The way you raise a child doesn't affect the fact that he suffers from ADHD or not. However, the way you raise a child with ADHD will have a great impact on his self-esteem, for example. Environment affects the behavior's associated problems intensity. A stimulating and open supervision allows a better evolution and reduces ADHD-associated handicaps. If a child with ADHD has good intellectual and emotional resources, he'll be able to develop efficient adaptation techniques more easily. He always had difficulty because he didn't want to do his homework. It was hard. We had to supervise him all the time. I had disturbing and clownish behavior. It was not easy for some teachers. We believe that in ADHD, there is a difficulty to modulate messages on a biological level. In the human body, there are neurons, which are equivalent to roads where information circulates. At crossroads, or when the information transfers from one neuron to the other, the message goes from electric to biochemical and is modulated by neurotransmitters such as noradrenaline and dopamine. With attention deficit disorder, medication will enhance the noradrenaline and dopamine neurotransmission that'll reduce attention deficit symptoms intensity. Cerebral imagery is more often used in research. We don't use it to make an attention deficit disorder diagnostic. There are two types of cerebral imagery. There's structural cerebral imagery where we see the volume and dimension of some brain regions. And there's functional cerebral imagery where we see brain activity in some regions when the subjects are doing a task, whether it's a motor task or a more cognitive task. Different studies show differences in the brains of people with ADHD and control subjects. While doing a task, there are differences in certain brain regions such as the size and the activity of those regions. When we look at a brain, that's the front and there's the back here. Structural cerebral imagery studies show that some regions in the brain, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here, the cerebellum and some basal nuclei inside the brain, are smaller for people with attention deficit disorder than for people who don't have it. At a functional level, these regions in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex the cerebellum and another region here I am showing you inside the brain another region we call cingulate gyrus this region here plus these two others I just talked about are less activated when people are doing a cognitive task there are other regions in the brain that are more activated for people suffering from attention deficit disorder which would indicate that people suffering from attention deficit disorder are using other strategies to do certain tasks 
tasks, but those strategies are less efficient. It's like instead of taking the highway to transfer information, they would take the secondary road, which is much slower and much more chaotic, until the final destination. My grandson used to do some things that often seemed extreme to us. And we'd tell him, well, why'd you do that? Why'd you act like that? And his response was very good, but we didn't know why he said that. He'd say, it's not me, it's my brain. For a few years now, it seems that attention deficit disorder is not conceptualized as an attention deficit. It's more an attention control problem, and not just attention control, but motor function control. This notion of control is generated by what we call executive functions. While beginning to do a task, a person who has difficulty to concentrate can have a lot of ideas in their head. They must put aside the unrelated ideas in order to achieve the task. This can be very difficult for someone with attention deficit disorder. The person can begin a task and right in the middle of it, some ideas come into their head or there's a noise outside that makes them think about something else. Then they can go from one to the other and end up doing something that isn't useful for what they have to do, at work for example. When people with attention deficit disorder have an idea, they don't want to lose it. Therefore, they can have a tendency to interrupt to say their idea in the middle of a conversation. Someone who has difficulty controlling their motor activity will have a hard time to stay calm, to stay put. Anger is one of the hardest emotions to manage for people suffering from attention deficit disorder. They have a tendency to be irritable and to get angry for nothing.